everyone. I'm your host, Ravi Straczynski. Thank you so much for joining us on episode number 96 of Cards Chat, the friendliest poker podcast in town. Today's guest is one of the fastest rising young stars in poker. Having only primarily played tournaments for less than five years, he's already amassed over a million dollars in live tournament earnings, plus much more, much more online, including a coveted World Series of Poker bracelet in an online event last year. Not only a great player, but his skills and development have earned him a prominent spot on the roster of instructors at PokerCoaching.com, one of the world's best poker training sites. Today, we welcome Justin Saliba to the Card Chat Podcast. Justin, how you doing? I'm great, man. Thanks for having me on. How are you? Wonderful. Thank you. It's good to see you again, speak with you. Uh, nice uh, nice occasion. You know, we've, we've spoken... Uh, Quite a lot, actually. I think we've known each other for a good three, maybe even four years already at this point. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. been great. It's yeah, been great. and and we got to meet uh, also this uh, past year. It was a lot of fun. Uh, but, you know, it's funny, until we started doing the research for this uh, show, I didn't know the origin story. I didn't realize it. Um, you know, so obviously professional player. I know from pokercoaching.com stuff. So uh, now we get to sort of dig into it. Um, okay, you let, let's start, you know, the elephant in the room. You're not the typical moneymaker pro. You're 27 years old. So how did poker first come into your life? You know, it's funny because even though, you know, so I'm not the moneymaker era, I feel mm -hmm. like I, I still was a little bit. I was really? just way younger, you know, because my older brother played a lot when I was young. And so I was like 11 or 12 years old. And my brother was maybe 16 at the time. Uh-huh. And him and his friends were so into it. And, and when you're that age, like, I just wanted to be doing anything they were doing, you know? And, uh -huh. and so I was watching the game. We were playing a neighborhood game every week. We were constantly trying to, like, play free rolls and, you know, take surveys to get $10 free play online for poker. And yep. we'd all sit, you know, sit around and play. So it, even though I was, you know, a younger kid at the time, I think that the excitement of, of that era still kind of affected me and really, you know, gave me that early love for poker and an early desire to like just play a lot of cards um that's, from a young age that's pretty cool was it i mean everyone also knows you know to like a, a teenager you know give them a couple hundred bucks that may feel like a million was it the idea of like kind of having your own money was that cool or was it the fame the glory or was it something uh about the game of poker in particular yeah i, I mean you know i i think it had almost nothing to do with the money of it i think it hmm. I think it was just the competition of it. It was another game that I could try to compete in. And when I was, you know, when you're the younger brother, the physical things were a lot harder at yeah. that age, <laughs> yeah. you know? And so like, I distinctly remember always playing basketball and soccer and, and sports with these guys, but I was, you know, just smaller than them, weaker than them at the time. Right. And so it felt like another game that you could just compete in and just like, want to win you know want to win this game and try to figure out how to beat your opponents and mm -hmm. yeah i think it was like the competitive nature of it that that really was was the draw because you know we were kids i i don't even think i thought about money at the time we, we would never play for money you know so mm -hmm. um yeah I, I just think i really love the competition of it so you know when you are you know smaller than you know the older guys you know uh your older brother their friend that sort of thing it yeah. often tends to be much harder uh, to win at sporting competitions but you know when it's a uh, brain game a mind game that sort of a thing were you able to find success in certain spots against these older kids yeah you know i'm not sure it was the brain game or if it was the luck aspect of poker <laughs> but i'm sure i uh you know i'm sure i had my fair share of wins in those games for for one of the reasons you know it's uh you know they were obviously going to be like just naturally better and smarter than i was mm -hmm. uh but but when you get pocket aces, you get pocket aces and you get right. to stop your opponents. So, so I think I, I think I, I got to enjoy the, the, uh, maybe the, the guy playing with the, the negative edge, but still feeling the wins, you know? Right. Right. What were the stakes? Just chips. Okay. Wow. And that's still like, so all of you were just playing nothing, you know, actual to win other than the pride of winning. A hundred percent. Yeah. We would all like, there was a guy, his name is Riley Beck. He, you know, was a really great family friend. And he had like a poker table in his basement. Mm -hmm. And I think there was like a TV down there or something. And so we would just constantly watch reruns of main event, final tables and wow. things like that as we we're just sitting around the table and playing cards for hours mm -hmm. and hours. So, uh, yeah, I, maybe they were betting like $1, $5, things like that. But like, as far as I can remember, we were just playing and, and just enjoying it. 
was it tournament style or cash game style? Always tournament style. Uh huh. Yeah. And so, okay, so I can understand that uh, wanting to to be in the winner's circle, get all the chips in the end. For sure, yeah. Wow, very interesting. Uh, what other sort of stuff did you watch uh, besides the main event? I think, uh, you know, uh, my, my, our good buddy, Mike, uh, he knows us both. Uh, shout out to Mike Patrick. Uh, he yes. discovered, used to watch uh, Tilt on ESPN, yes. yeah? <laughs> you know, it's funny because I talked to people who are who've been around, you know, longer than me, and they all hated that show. But, I, <laughs> but as a kid we thought it was the coolest thing you know like i don't remember much about the show but yeah mm -hmm. we would we would watch it and it was probably one of those things that maybe i liked it so much because i probably was too young to be watching it i probably like my parents probably wouldn't have been too happy uh mm -hmm. you know knowing that i was you know binging tilt but, but yeah just like <laughs> the excitement of it i remember like some scenes of like winning and just like having to deal with the mobsters or getting beat up and things like that. And <laughs> it was like, man, this is really exciting. <laughs> A legendary show for sure. <laughs> well, you said, you know, every so often, you know, you fill out these online surveys, you make it 10 bucks or so, you know, that is actual money. You know, you're playing for online. Were you thinking of like, what was your mind of the set to build a bankroll though? And like actually accumulate money online since that was an actual thing for you? So Hmm. So I think inherently, yes, but not because of the money. I mm. just think that I wanted to be able to play more poker. Uh -huh. You know, like it wasn't like I need to build a bankroll and like have good bankroll management. Like there was none of that. We right. were playing the three person, like three man sit and goes. Mm -hmm. And if you had enough, if you took a survey, you got to play one $7 plus 70 cent three person sit and go. And if you won, you got to play more, you know? And so like, that was just kind of, kind of how it started and so wow you know we would just be grinding the three person sit and goes having no idea what we we're doing and you know I, I joke with a lot of my my friends who you know came before me it's like yeah that's why they were so soft because if if i if we got 70 dollars in account or 77 we were playing a 70 dollar plus seven dollar sit and go and like i'm sure that was a real game for a lot of people that were you know playing those stakes so yeah they were they were battling with the the 12 year olds of the world <laughs> It was a, a very interesting golden age of poker. That's for sure. My <laughs> goodness. That's, that's 15 years ago already. Unbelievable. Yeah. Well, you know, okay. So it's obviously something that you love, something that you're clearly passionate about, you know, even if it's not the, the money that matters. You did go to college though. Uh, you majored yeah. in uh, chemical engineering at the University of Dayton. What did you think your path was going to be? Was that ever like a thing of like, you know, I'm going to be a I don't know, chemical engineer or, a, you know, working in a lab or scientist or something? Yeah, so I think kind of what happened was, you know, my older brother and those that generation of guys grew up, and then I grew up, and poker was kind of like not as important, not as fun to do together anymore. So right. I still like enjoyed it, but I didn't play it as much in like high school. Um, and I was very serious in like soccer and then chess. And so then I went to college and was playing soccer and going to school for engineering. I think that, uh, you know, both my parents were chemical engineers. So it made it really easy as a kid who didn't know what he wanted to do to just mm -hmm. major in that. I was like, I like math. I like science. My parents did it easy kind of like choice. Sure. Um, it, and so I'm not sure. I, I don't think I ever envisioned myself as a in the lab chemical engineer. Okay. I think I, I think it was more like, I really like math and science. You can kind of use it. You can go to med school with it. You can like yeah. go into law with it. You can, you know, you can go so many different directions with like a good foundation. So I think that was kind of more my mindset. And then in college, I was really focused on soccer. Uh, we had a really good team at Dayton, you know, a bunch of my roommates ended up getting drafted and going pro. And so I think like for a long time, that was kind of on my mind. I, I, I thought I wanted to play soccer for a really long time. Um, so yeah, I think even in college, I didn't really know what I wanted. I, I had very, very little clue what like my life path ended, was going to end up looking like. And I was really open to whatever for it. If I was going to use the degree and do something with it or, um, you know, get drafted and go play soccer for try to go pro and, and play for a long time. So I, I was right. really open to open to whatever at, at that time. Interesting. Well, I, obviously the, you know, the conversation now turns to your involvement with uh, pokercoaching.com because that's when it sort of became a more serious thing. But before we get there, I do just sort of have a question. Now, again, like a smart guy, studious guy, um, you know, it 
to be, have a degree in chemical engineering is no simple feat, you know, like you obviously <laughs> got to put in the hours, you know, you said, you know, get in the lab. Well, you know, that's, you got to get in the studying lab. That's for sure. Yeah. Is there still nonetheless something that, and, and it, like just such an important message to tell, you know, our audience and everyone, you know, you know, yeah, go to school regardless, no matter what, you know, no matter how talented you are at something, you know, the best basketball players also go to college, you know, same thing. Yeah. What do you think you gained most from the college experience, whether it's in the classrooms, socially, anything like that, that continues to help you today uh, in your poker career? Man, I mean, I mean, so many things, like, like so, so many things. It's hard to, hard to pick like the most important, but I mean, being on your own for the first time is just huge. Mm. Like living away from your family and having no one looking over your shoulder, telling you, you know, go to school, go to class, mm -hmm. do your homework, like these things. It's like the self-reliance and the, the ability to like create really good habits and, and, um, you know, kind of be the owner of your own life for the first time a little bit. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, college was huge, huge for me in that regard and like taking ownership of my own decisions and mistakes and everything. And so I, I'm not going to say I was like the hardest worker in, in school. I, I definitely like worked hard and, and did fine in school, but um, the balance of sport, sports and school like together, mm -hmm. I was just constantly working. I mean, I was constantly in the gym trying to get stronger, you know, out on the field trying to get better back in back home in the classroom, like studying for the exams like I I it kind of put me in the go go mindset a little bit where I think that mindset now really really benefits me because you know after like a world series of poker after like a long series or things like that people need to take breaks and decompress and I think that like my turnaround rate right now is just it gives me an edge I, I really right. think like I I'm I'm okay finishing a long session at midnight and going and doing some work for two hours and and going to bed like I don't I, I like that stuff I like to be constantly active and working and I think it was definitely like the college experience that that gave me um the opportunities to make mistakes in like a controlled environment with that regard and now in real life like be able to kind of pull a lot of those lessons and 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 use them in real life really cool great answer guys if you're not watching if you're just listening you don't see that I'm smiling part of the reason is sure I'm not a professional poker player but boy do I know that that feeling very well if you finish a poker session even my one of my home games five six hours you get home yeah you put in another hour or two of work no biggie you know yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's something that definitely resonates very much with me um so how did pokercoaching.com <clears throat> kind of like creep back into your life and you got associated with you know with jonathan little um you know who you know owns runs the site um how did that sort of become a thing again? And you sort of, you know, while doing all this stuff and, you know, putting in your college hours and all of that effort towards training physically for soccer and stuff, at what point did that sort of enter and become more of a a growing part of your life once again? Yeah, so I think that it's probably my junior year of college. There was a, like a, a local game at the, called the Ruggles Club in Beaver Creek, Ohio. And I decided to go play, you know, I, I just like, I hadn't played poker in a long time. I decided to go play one, two and just have some fun with it. And I think it kind of reignited all those like childhood feelings I had about the game. Mm. And so that Christmas all, you know, they're like, what should we get? What should I was like, poker books. I, I want poker books. I want poker content. I want poker, poker, poker. Like this is the, wow. this is my winter, my winter break fascination, you know, get back into this stuff. Because I think that like when you're a kid, I didn't realize there were, I didn't think about the fact that there's avenues to learn and get better. Mm -hmm. We were just playing for fun, but now it's like I was a student and I was just constantly trying to learn things. Right. And now I'm seeing that there's really these avenues to improve. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, I have to, I have to do this. And so <clears throat> a few of the books were from Jonathan Little. Ah. And so I went through all of his books, Alex Fitzgerald books, um, Jonathan Little books and took a bunch of notes. And then, I started to play more and more. And then in my senior year, I actually reached out to Jonathan because I've been playing a lot more online poker and I asked him for coaching and he gave me his rates for coaching and they were too expensive. I, I was, you know, playing small stakes online cash. You were a college um, student. I was a college student. <laughs> of yeah, course. exactly. Right. So this is what, like about six, seven years ago, something like that? This was um, 2017. Yeah. Okay. So five years ago. Yeah. Yep. So I graduated December of 17. This was probably like I don't know, summer of 2017 or, or fall of 2017. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of like, 
came back to him instead of just saying like, Hey, it's not, you know, I can't afford it. It was more because I was on his site. I'd read all of his books. Like I knew his content pretty well from that at that time. And I kind of mentioned a few things that I thought he could be doing better for his content. And yeah. one of those things was like social. I was like, your stuff on social sucks. Like wow. I'm seeing like, I'm really liking your site, but like nobody knows about this and that and that because like, you know, not everybody's on your email list or whatever. And so I, I asked him if I could intern for him in return for coaching. And he said, what a yeah. Great, what a great, like, at such a college guy thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> like, again, yeah. it's very stereotypical, but like to think in the, in the, in the, you know, in the, in the direction of doing an internship and just to also be so bold as to, Hey, you know, you, Hey, Jonathan, who's running his business and knows what he's doing as a pro. Sure. I'm yeah. just going to tell you some, some things you do suck. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I think it's a little bit of like that ignorant confidence too. Right. You know? Cause like, <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. I have no idea. I was doing chemical engineering. I have no experience in marketing or any of that stuff. Right. Um, but I had that like ignorant confidence that like, all right, like I can figure it out. I can give, I can like provide him value. Wow. Um, <clears throat> and he said, yes. So like mm -hmm. we ended up doing it where, I would work 10 hours on his social and most of it, most of what I would do would be watching his content. So he gave me a free access to his site and I would watch a lot of his content and I would just be taking notes and then I would send it to somebody or figure out how to like turn those notes into a thread or into a graphic or, you know, something like that, like taking right. pillar content and making it like little sub content to help them market. And through that, I was learning a lot about poker. And then every 10 hours of work I would put in, he would coach me for one hour. Okay. And so I was playing, yeah, I was playing 25 and L online. And that was like the game I decided I was going to grow my bankroll at. Um, and yeah, he would, he would just give me an hour of coaching and that would, that would work out to be about twice a month. So we did about twice a month for like, I don't know, five months or six months. Amazing. Very, very cool origins. So, okay. There was a shift there, a little subtle shift because we have been talking about what you love about the game, the competition, wanting to win. And now you're talking about playing 25 NL. That's cash game stuff. So mm -hmm. at this point, were you sort of saying, I've got an end goal to become a professional poker player and make a living from this? Hmm. That definitely wasn't my initial thought. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that I was just very, very fascinated with the game. Mm -hmm. I, I just... It's kind of one of those things when you start to learn something and you realize how much more you have to learn. Mm. I love that process. Like I just love the process of trying to get really good at something and having that, like having the endorphins of like, Oh my gosh, I feel like I got better, but now there's so much more, you know, you kind of like, it's like opening your eyes to all this, all these new things. Um, so I think just like the fascination with the game in general uh, was really, really what was driving me at the time, because even, I mean, even when I was playing those games, like trying to build a bankroll, I definitely wasn't thinking to myself, like, I'm going to move to Vegas and I'm going to be a pro. And I, right. that wasn't even on my mind. You know, I was just trying to get good and, and good at poker. Yeah, right. I, I didn't know what, what it meant at the time. So, you know, no matter how well you play, sometimes the cards don't necessarily run your way. I imagine uh, it wasn't just a, a graph that goes straight up. Perhaps <laughs> uh, there were some downswings there. Did that deter you in any way? And did you ever start asking yourself, what the hell am I doing spending all of this time playing? Oh, maybe what he's doing, what, what Jonathan's telling me isn't working. You know, did that ever those thoughts cross your mind or, or was it more like, you know, like the video game? You just want to keep on playing until you beat the end boss. Yeah. So, I mean, so let's, let's fast forward a little bit. I graduated in December and the way it works in soccer is, you typically want to graduate at the end of the year because the MLS draft is in March, March or like, yeah, March or early April, something like that. And so from December to April, you just kind of stay healthy. And like, there's like combines and, you know, so I, I went to like Toronto FC combine, went to like some Pitt, Pittsburgh Riverhounds combine. You kind of like show yourself a little bit and then see if you're going to get picked up by a team to go play professionally. But you actually don't have much to do for four months besides stay healthy and fit. And so that was the time where I moved back into my parents and I was just playing so much poker because I had, I didn't have school anymore. Right. I mean, I'd graduated at that time and I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, so for those months, I grew a pretty good bankroll. I'd moved up to 200 and now very quickly. Nice. Crushed 25, crushed 50 and had felt really good about poker. It was, you know, it's funny. Cause like, 
I mean, you had that ignorant confidence, like very quickly for some, I mean, I thought I was like so good at poker, you know, like, <laughs> and I just remember thinking like, I'm so, so good. And then I don't get drafted in March I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do, but I'm still playing a lot of poker. And at right. that point I had like 25, 30 K bankroll. Mm -hmm. And I decided that the smart thing to do was to play 10, 20 online. So I just very quickly went and played huge stakes and I, I still wasn't even taking it that seriously. At this point, I feel like I have to ask the question, you're working with Jonathan and he's coaching you. Did yeah. you tell him that that's what you're going to do? No. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I imagine he would have held up a stop sign or something. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, a hundred percent. He, he gave me nothing but like pretty sharp advice in that time, mm -hmm. but I had, I was just, yeah, I was just ignorant confidence and like I was running so hot in, or in those early stages mm -hmm. and it gave me this like just feeling that I was just so good. And so I would sit on my parents' couch next to my dad watching Netflix to tabling 1020. I mean, it, it was like just the most absurd. I would take things at, at 200 and 0 so seriously. I followed my graph perfectly. I looked over so many hands. I would be extremely disciplined. But then like at the end of the day, I'd be like, eh, let's just hop in and see what happens. And I would just be laying on the couch, not taking it that seriously, five betting the ace nine zero for like a 5K pot when I have no, you know, very little money to my name. So right. that was the first experience of like big downswing, bad decision making, young kid type stuff. And mm -hmm. at that point, I thought I was going to be done. I went, I, I had no money. I mean, I, I had 25,000. I very quickly went to like a few hundred dollars left in my, in my account. And that was the time I was like, okay, this isn't for me. I, you know, I need to get a job. I need to do something else because like poker is, you know, poker's not it. Poker's yeah. not it for me. Mm -hmm. so that, that was my first big like downswing, like self-inflicted. I don't even know if you call it a downswing. It was a downswing, but it was just like me just torching money, you know, like right. my 200 no graph was still incredible. Like I was still like crushing that, crushing like the small stakes games I should have been playing. Um, but I now had no bankroll. <laughs> so, you know, the work that you did, the arrangement that you had with Jonathan, like the uh, basically bartering, eventually that turned into significantly more. Was that the point that it happened or were you kind of like busboying and, you know, movie ticket, you know, movie theater ushering in the interim? No, no. So that, that was the point. I, I mean, that this was like a huge, um, you know, a huge turning point in, mm -hmm. in like my trajectory. Because when, once this happened, I sent him a note of what happened, kind of. You know, I, I, I'm sure I, I, I was probably toned back a little bit about how reckless it was. <laughs> um, but I sent him a note and said, hey, like, I really appreciate everything you, you've done for me. I really, really like poker. But I think it's just going to be better as a hobby for me. Um, you know, thanks for everything, kind of. And all his response was, was, hey, why don't you give me a call tomorrow? And so he, he had me give him a call and, you know, I didn't know, I, I didn't quite know what that was going to look like. Right. Um, but so he gave me a call and, and was kind of asking like more details of what was going on. And I was kind of telling him and he's like, look, like, what are your thoughts about just taking on more work for me full time? As a paid and, position. As a paid position. Right. Exactly. Instead of, go, cause I, the other opportunity was like me going, looking for a job in engineering. Um, so I'd applied to a bunch of jobs at this point. Um, and so, yeah, he was like, give me a call, called him. And he was like, yeah, what, what do you think about taking on a paid position for me? Um, and at the time I had no idea what that even looked like, you know, right. like I was, and he didn't know what that looked like either, but, but it was kind of like, Hey, I think that, you know, you're a good poker player. Like if you want to make this work, I believe in you. I think you can make this work. And also to help make this work, I'm going to give you more work and, and income um, through pokercoaching.com. And so mm -hmm. that was a, the huge change in trajectory. Where, I, mm -hmm. So I, I've got to ask then, so there's clearly, you know, you get off the phone with Jonathan, right? I'm trying to like, let's get into your mind that day, that evening, whatever it was, you know, all of the experiences you've talked about up until now, uh, yeah. you know, love for the game, your downswing, you know, you've got your degree in hand. I don't know what your family is necessarily thinking or pushing you towards. What is it that sort of tipped the scales, you know, as you're kind of like having this conversation with yourself of like, maybe that makes sense to do. 
Mm. I'm, I'm not sure I even ever thought about what made sense, you know, like mm. e even now I don't, I don't know. I'm not like a pros and cons list guy. Uh -huh. you know, I, I'm kind of like, I'm kind of more of a seize the opportunity type person. So mm -hmm. like when that opportunity presented itself, I didn't really think about if it made sense or didn't make sense. It was like, I'm going to make the most of this opportunity. Like mm -hmm. this is a second chance for me to like play poker. Right. I mean, that was like essentially what happened. It, it, it became very clear to me that like my issues were very self-inflicted and a, and a product of me being young and immature. And like, mm -hmm. I knew that even at the time I was just like, like, how did this happen type of thing? Mm -hmm. And when this opportunity presented itself, I, I didn't think about if it made sense or not. It was, this is going to work. Like this is, this is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, he kind of, yeah, he, he mentioned that he, I was going to work for, like, he was open to me working full time. He was happy to provide work for it. Um, and then I moved to Vegas two weeks later and that was it. Wow. Oh, so that part of the, part of the deal of working full time was having to move to Las Vegas. So, so there was actually a gap of time there, but, mm. but it was beneficial for, for the company to have me in Vegas and for me to like, kind of be, you know, in the poker scene a little bit more. Uh -huh. Um, and so I don't know, I think from Jonathan's perspective, it was fine if I stayed in Ohio. Right. Um, but from my perspective, I wanted to be in Vegas. And so I kind of said that I kind of set goals and was like, okay, this was maybe like July. So two weeks later, I was like, I'm going to Vegas. And I actually didn't pick up and move. I set goals that were like, okay, if by the end of the year, I'm okay, I'm going. And so that, that was kind of like the flow of, of time. Right. Right. Yeah. Amazing. What do you miss, uh, if anything about uh, living in Ohio near your parents? Just, just my family. Uh -huh. you know yeah just family and friends like it, it was uh yeah it was a big move a, a, a lot of distance in between so yeah try, try to get back and see them a lot but that's that's the uh that's pretty much everything i miss for sure and well beyond the uh, professional opportunities both with you know the, the work that you do as well as the play that you do what uh what is it that uh you like about las vegas Whew, i love everything about vegas man i mean i think that I mean, I kind of joke with my friends that when you move from like the Midwest to the West, it like takes 10 years off your life, just like by moving, because <laughs> I felt like everybody, you know, in Ohio, they grow up really fast in terms of mm -hmm. they have a family and kids and, um, you know, you settle down quickly and, and you kind of, uh, you know, just grow up fast. And I felt like out in Vegas and out West in general, um, you know, you, you, it's a little bit of a slower process, you know, which I really like. I really have enjoyed the fact that, you know, I'm 27 and I think most of my friends in Ohio are, are married and, and mm -hmm. have kids and families. And like, that's something that like, maybe I want to do one day, but it's not something I want to do anytime soon. Uh, right. So I really like like the lifestyle out here of, of that. Um, and then the nature is incredible. I mean, the sun, the sun and the weather. And then the fact that, you know, you can go to the mountains quickly, you can get to Zion fast, San Diego fast, Phoenix, like, yeah, I love uh, I love all the outdoors outdoors things you can do. It's good I, stuff. I, Not good to just sit in the poker room or uh, in front of the computer all the time. For sure, that's good. That's good. Sure. Well, we mentioned uh, at the top that uh, you're also now a coach at PokerCoaching.com, which is pretty cool. Again, quite the evolution uh, from your origin story with them of just uh, bartering to work and stuff. Now you're <laughs> coaching because uh, yeah. you know again like who who knows uh, stuff you know better better than you who've you know you've literally explored all avenues of it um you know you're from what i understand what i remember as well you primarily coach uh game theory optimal play right what is it about that that appeals to you and what do you think prospective students could learn from your style of instruction yeah so one second, but I'll give you more time to think about it. And the reason I'm asking this question is because, you know, yeah, sure, you're a math guy, but the whole getting into solvers and charts, it's not necessarily for everyone. So clearly that's Absolutely. an approach that you decided to take. So that's why I'm wondering uh, about that question. Yeah. So I, I think, I think the original reason why was because Jonathan had me read Will Tipton's books mm. right away. And 
it was very game theory optimal based Mm -hmm. and it just like got me so fascinated with the game and so fascinated with you know the different game theory principles that were at play and how it doesn't matter what your opponents have if you play a correct strategy you know based on their their holding that Mm -hmm. they're going to make no ev you know like that to me as a concept just was like so cool that you know the fact that if i play a strong strategy they can't exploit me there's nothing they can do to to affect me and so that kind of was what started my uh, fascination with it and then i yeah i mean i really loved all the solvers and the software that that you could use so i think that what people could like learn from game theory optimal in general and and some of the coaching i do is like it's just about baseline frequencies i think that when you have a really strong fundamental understanding of the game and and how you want to play certain spots and how equities play versus each other. Like when you have a lot of equity in the pot and when you don't have a lot of equity in the pot and what that does for your overall strategy, it makes everything else easier. You know, like I teach game theory optimal strategies, but when I play, I'm never like, oh, let me just blindly execute a game theory optimal strategy. You know, right. I'm constantly trying to not do that because because you make, you know, you're going to make way more money if you're just like very perceptive of what, how people are playing. And mm-hmm. this guy's never bluffing the river. So what's the adjustment I'm going to make, you know, right. and things like that. But having like the fundamental understanding, I think is extremely important to be able to have a baseline to like deviate from, mm-hmm. you know, if you don't have a baseline, it's harder to, to pick how far you're going to move and what exploitative direction you're going to go. Uh, but if you have a really strong fundamentals and really strong baseline, the mistakes you're going to be making are much smaller and, and in general, you're going to have a better, um, just a better baseline to deviate from, I would say. Sure. Yeah, fair. And uh, folks, if you are interested, obviously that's uh, what Justin has to offer as far as uh, coaching and you know where to find him. Um, so just to sort of circle back to, again, the competitive aspect, the tournament stuff, the cash game stuff, you're primarily a tournament player now, right? Currently, yep. Yeah. When did that switch happen and why? Yeah. So when I moved to Vegas, I thought I was going to play live cash. That was kind of the thought. It's like, I'm beating 200 and now I hadn't moved up again, moved up to 500 and now it was kind of a tougher game. My win rate went way down. I decided I was going to go play live cash. I went and played live cash. I hated it. I thought it was just such a miserable experience. And what uh, stakes are you playing live cash? What's I was playing the five, yeah, five, 10, 10, 20. Okay. And I just was not enjoying it at all. It was a very oh. slow game. The player pool wasn't extremely um, interesting. You know, like, like I didn't, I wasn't meeting people that I was like, felt were similar to me. It was kind of a nitty game. Mm-hmm. And so I played it for six weeks. I went back to my computer and played online. Uh, and then COVID happened and yeah. everybody went online. And so, yeah, the, all of 2019, I was playing online cash. 2020, I was playing mostly online cash um and 2020 was COVID. okay so actually 2019 the middle i played one tournament i played the main event in that summer and my friends some of my friends that i'd met through you know playing basketball and things like that were all playing tournaments and i was just happy playing my cash games and and voting and keep continuing to build my bankroll sure but in 2020 i kind of had felt the bug a little bit mm-hmm. and playing a little bit more tournaments here and there online for fun, just small stakes, just to learn. And then one of my good friends, Aram Zobian, um, was like really playing big tournaments and traveling and things like that. And during COVID, he decided that he was going to travel to Mexico to play the GG series. And so I went with him and decided that, okay, if I'm going to go do this, I need to study and kind of start transitioning over. Uh, so we lived in Playa del Carmen for six weeks. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was kind of like the first time where I was, really grinding tournaments hard and and really focused on uh you know switching switching over and you enjoyed this because it's funny because you said about the live games what was specifically not appealing to you then again some someone could counter well if you're playing online you know you're just staring at a screen it's just you yourself now i'm sure you are your own best company that's fine but (laughs) you know what is it that you know I guess still got your gears going in a good way about, you know, continuing to play online. Was it just back to the competitive aspect? So it was the competitive aspect, but I think it was like the fascination with the game. Hmm. The issue I had at the time with live 
was that I played so few interesting spots in a 10 hour session of these mm, live cash games. Much slower. Yeah, for sure. Much slower. But if I'm, you know, four tabling the ignition 200 and L pool, I'm playing so many hands, you know, I'm getting 85 hands an hour per table. Right. And I'm getting so many fun spots mm -hmm. and like that fascination with, with the intricacies of the game. I think that is, is like where, where my joy was, was mostly coming from. And as a, you know, not just a teacher, but a student of the game, you know, I'm curious as your like progression as a player as well, how much study time do you put in per hour of playtime? And did that change over the years? Okay. Yeah. So in those days, I was studying way more than I was playing. Mm -hmm. And that was a big problem for me. Um, I wasn't having as much fun playing. Mm -hmm. And it's really, really bad for your volume when you do that. Right. Even though it's good, <laughs> you know, it's, it's good to get good at poker and those things. But I was really struggling to grind the hours I needed to grind. And so that was a, a progression for me was that I was one of the rare people that I enjoyed studying the game more than I did playing the game in those days. And so I actually had to get back to like that competitive nature of it because, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think I was in the mindset too much of wanting to learn, wanting to grow and improve that I actually just found more joy in that part of it. Uh -huh. uh, whereas, whereas now, you know, I'm, I try to trying to train myself to be, you know, much more competitive in nature, kind of get, getting back to those like uh, original feelings about poker. And then I'm studying maybe 20% of the time compared to, you know, maybe 55 at, at one point. Got it. And that's uh, a much better balance for you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think so. Nice. I, think, I mean, there's definitely times where there's definitely weeks where I'm studying way more than I'm playing. Um, but overall with different live series and things like that, I, I, I would say I'm pretty happy at 80, 80, 20. And I think that that, that progression, I think, is actually something that I got really lucky for. I think it's really good at, you know, early on in your career to study more than you play and then study less and less and less as you get better and better right. um, compared to how much you play. You still need to study a lot. But right. Yeah, right. I got kind of lucky that 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 was how I ended up progressing with it. Well, you know, again, let, lest we lose focus of the big picture here. Uh, you know, you're still doing a lot of stuff for pokercoaching.com. Is that still a full-time pursuit or has that also diminished slightly over the years? Yeah. So the time allotment has, has diminished in, in some ways. I think like anytime you're in a small company, you, you wear a lot of hats. And mm -hmm. so when I came on, it was Jonathan, his business partner, Dan, and then me who, you know, that was it. That was it. In oh, I didn't realize that. Wow. Yeah, I, I, I guess they, they probably had one other. They probably had uh, this guy, Al, at the time, too. Okay. Um, wow. But I never met Al. So, yeah, it was just three. And then the team started to grow and grow. And, you know, you know, you know, Brian's great. You know, Dan's great. Oliver, some of the other guys, you know, James Kieran. So the team definitely grew. And, and that was a focus kind of like from the whole team over the last few years where it's can we wear less hats that we're good at and just wear, you know, the, our best hats. And so like my, mm -hmm. my best value that I can bring for the company is in content. Um, and so almost a hundred percent of my job now is to just manage the content and kind of be the head of our content strategy uh, in, in a curriculum for, for all of the coaches and the courses and things like that. Cool. And so it's still a full-time endeavor, mm -hmm. but it's, it's less hours of, of work and more, you know, higher focused hours on, on building courses and, and things like that. That's interesting. And I, I specifically keep on going back to that because, you know, you're kind of, um, you know, unique in that situation because you are a professional poker player. You know, I don't know what you put on your IRS tax return as your <laughs> official profession, but like, you know, nonetheless, you still work. You have your feet on the ground at a real job, you know? Yeah, 100%. How do, how do you kind of like flip the switch, work-life balance, that sort of a thing? Do you intend to continue this? Because so many people, they get into the game, they they study, but they just go whole hog and they're just full-time pro. Yeah, I mean, I have no intention of, of not continuing it. I, I think that that was definitely a worry that Jonathan and some of the guys had that, you, got you know, too as good. I was, <laughs> yeah, well, not even too good, but like as I was getting better and, you know, playing bigger games and things like that. that and winning, would, yeah. It, yeah, exactly. Um, but it provides such a great balance in my life. I mean, mm. 
I have gone like everybody, like everybody else, you know, you go through ups and downs. And one of the downs for me comes from it feeling very selfish to sit behind my computer, have no social interaction and just grind for my hourly, especially back when I was playing online cash games. And all of a sudden I I'm at work and it's like, I'm a part of a team and we're building things and we're helping people and we're building the poker space, the community. And it's like, that brings me a lot of joy. Um, so yeah, I think that I no intention of leaving. I think that they've done such a great job and, and helped me so much that when I do work for them now, a lot of it's studying, you know, like, mm. you know, we'll, we'll preview some of the things coming the rest of the year, but I've been working on, you know, a lot of ICM work and pre-flop ICM charts and, a lot of that work is just me studying and improving my own ICM game. Um, and then how can we teach that to other people and trying to go through that process? So a lot of the work I'm doing now, it kind of has an overlap with study time, which is nice. Right. But yeah, I really enjoy it. And, and yeah, I mean, you know, the team, you know, those guys, they're, they're such great guys. It's hard to, uh, it, it, it's impossible to ever leave. They're going to have to kick me out. <laughs> <laughs> I think I remember like, um, so like a two-part thing. I think I remember like when I saw, Justin Saliba wins bracelet, right? And I yeah. think Jonathan replied to that, please don't leave or something like that. I think there was like a, <laughs> like a tweet or something like that. It was just funny. Um, yeah. But you know, it's that very, very cool. And I think it's such a great thing to say. I think it's such a, you know, I, I would like want to replay that last minute of your response over and over. <laughs> That's such a great nugget there from you. Uh, wonderful. You. Um, when I did see that though, Justin Saliba wins bracelet. I was like, that for me, that was an eye-opening moment because I just only knew you from the business. I didn't even realize at that point that you were playing professionally. So that was just a, a cool thing. And obviously, you know, you talk about this process of getting better and getting better, and we're not supposed to be results oriented, but my goodness, you know, a quarter million dollar win and you know, with yeah. an online bracelet, that's pretty cool. What does that feel like? Yeah, I, that was it was, I mean, it felt great. It was huge. It was uh before I moved to tournaments, I wanted to, I like really worked hard to try to stay behind the scenes and stay more anonymous. And I'm not exactly sure what was in my mind, but like the first course I made for poke coaching, I did it under a pseudonym because I didn't, <laughs> I didn't want anybody to know who I was. I, wow. I did it under my discord online name, just GTO. Right. And, you know, and that was like my first big course for the site. And, um, so it was like a, it was a weird moment of recognition where mm. I kind of thought my poke career was going to be one where I was never anybody, you know, I was never a, a name that people knew or anything like that. Um, and so, yeah, it was a very funny feeling having, you know, waking up in the morning and just having so many of like my friends and family, like reach out and congratulate and all those things is like, man, this is, what was I depriving of myself for? You know, I, mm. I didn't want to be known as a poker player and, and uh but then like the joys from it they, they came were uh were, were super high and, and like the support from other people was was just so enjoyable that yeah it was, a, it was that was like the first time where you know i really felt a lot of love from from non-poker people and, and right. that was a cool thing that was a cool well, thing. well you're certainly out of the shadows now you know over the last year you've got multiple five figure scores uh you got the wpt poker go tour ept monte carlo texas uh, you know, obviously we'll talk, uh, you know, momentarily about uh, the next great uh, WSOP run that you just had. But, uh, you know, what at what point did you sort of say, you know, maybe I start uh, I want to start traveling to these live events and, and get in front of the camera? Like, what is it that made you made that make that mental switch? Because you are in you are in the poker hub of the world already. Yeah. Yeah. So I think like my first live tournament cash was down in Florida last year. And that was my first live poker trip that I, that I'd ever gone on. And I just felt like my, I, I wanted to do, have a different lifestyle than I was having, mm. you know, it was, it was quite lonely, you know, just grinding the online cash games. And I, I was kind of like a lone wolf in those games too. I didn't, I didn't have a ton of friends that I talked poker with. Right. Um, I kind of built my spreadsheets and built my strategies and, and went from there. And, uh, like having that feeling of like community in, in like the live poker circuit was, was pretty fun. You know, it's, it's fun to like travel with your friends and go battle with, you know, other people. And, and um, yeah, I think it was, it was definitely just like that last January trip where I, I cashed my first WPT and, and I was like, okay, I want to do this. I, I want to 
I want to play live tournaments. This is, this is more fun. I feel like I'm, I've been working hard on tournaments for, you know, eight months at that point or something. And, mm-hmm. and I felt like I was really ready to, uh, to just dive in and, and go after live tournaments. Excellent. Well, let's talk about, uh, you know, one of those live tournaments you had, uh, at your biggest live score for $194,000 was a fourth place finish in just a couple months ago. It's funny, you know, it's funny to think uh, in the 3K WSOP shootout. So what was it like getting that? Because again, you've won a bracelet already, but it's online. It's different yeah, feeling, sure. you know, going through these, you know, crazy fields, you know, and getting that close, being, you know, in the mothership, you know, What's that feeling like, you know, when it's not just you in front of a screen, but when the world is watching? Yeah, I mean, it's great. It's, um, I love it. I, I love competing and running deep in these fields and having the support from friends and getting to battle. I, I think that something I kind of mentioned earlier that I'm trying to get back to is the fact that when you're playing these live events, it's really easy to just kind of be happy to be there. Mm. And all of a sudden you don't play as well. You know, you're a little bit too passive. You're a little yeah. bit like, just too joyous and and I, I remember watching that in sports like I remember thinking to myself when in college like people who are just like happy to be there they never perform their best you know mm-hmm. like you're happy to start in this game as the forward or something and you're you're a little bit too lackadaisical whereas like you have the guy who is so hungry all the time and it's like he doesn't care if he starts he doesn't care if he comes off the bench when he's on the field he's freaking going you know what yeah. I mean he's ready to go and I think that like reflecting on that and working with, with, you know, certain people um, really helped me to kind of get in a battle mode a little bit. And so these tournaments this summer in that 3k, I mean, it feels like you're in battle for hours and hours and hours and just, you know, it's so much more than poker, you know, you're battling poker on the felt, but like you're battling the fatigue of playing a long series, you know, you're having to battle the fact that you're looking across against your opponent and, you know, he's constantly chatting at you and doing these things to try to get you off your game. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I love that battle now. I think that the competition of it is is so much fun. And in that tournament, like, when you run deep and get to play with, you know, big players and big stages, like, there's, there's nothing more enjoyable than that. Well, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention a couple of those players. Obviously, the bracelet was won by David Jackson. It was his second. Uh, but all eyes, you know, with all due respect to David, to yourself, were on yeah. uh, Mr. Helmuth, who was chasing bracelet number 17. Um, you know, he didn't, he obviously didn't win. But, you know, when we talk about, you know, like you said, you're on the the world stage. You know, this is this is it, right? This yeah. is the same Justin who was playing, you know, at 12 years old, who was playing you know, in the home games, who was you know, making his way up, grinding. Yeah, you've won a bracelet, but, you know, you're really in the center of it all. And also, I mean, this is Phil Helmuth who you used to watch on TV. Yeah, for sure. Were there any jitters? Was there any, oh my God, type moments? How? And if not, how were you able to remain so focused and concentrate? Yeah, so I would say there's always some there's always some jitters in big spots. Mm. Um, now I've played with Phil before and, and I've been fortunate that I think early on when I was playing live and last year, I would say that I felt more anxious playing big hands against, you know, the Chidwicks, the Foxins, the, those guys. Sure. Um, but yeah, they weren't, I, I wouldn't say there were any jitters about playing with Phil. Maybe, maybe playing in that big spot, you know, it's, you're always going to be like a little on edge, but I love playing with Phil. I mean, he's a, he's just a, he's fun to play with. He's a fun guy. He's crazy. Like he can limp aces and four X five, three Oh, and peel three bets with the five, three Oh, and White magic. he's all over the place. You yeah. Know? So he's, <laughs> yeah. So it's uh yeah, he's great. Uh, he's always, um you know, fun to play with. And, and, you know, I know he like berates people and does some stuff, but none of that stuff bothers me. And maybe it's because it has never been focused at me or something, you know, but uh yeah, I had a great time playing with Phil and, and, you know, we went, we went back and forth uh, a, a little bit throughout the final day. And, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a great time. It's always fun, fun playing with Phil. Wonderful. Well, you know, you've obviously uh, accomplished uh, a ton in your poker career, as well as obviously on the professional side. Um, you know, my understanding is that there was a very 
handsome podcast host. You had a mixed game festival and you had a good time there. So is that the next frontier for you? You're going to master the Badoogies and Badesis? You know what, Robbie, man? That was one of my, that reminded <laughs> me of when I was a kid. You know, really? going to that mixed game festival and playing those games and seeing the people there and how much fun they were having, man, that was, that was so, so enjoyable, especially right in the middle of a series when, when things were, you know, stressful and busy and stuff. It was, it was so wonderful. And I, I mean, I talked to so many people about it now, you know, Dylan Lindy, I think he, he was there and Ali Najad went like everybody who goes to those has such a blast. So yeah, that was, that was such a fun time. And I'm not sure about mastering mix is, is in my near future, but, <laughs> but no, I mean, I, I played, um, I played maybe five mixed events this summer, WSOP. Okay. There and, you go. Uh, yeah. Next year I'm going to, I'm going to play way more, you know, I'm studying, studying a little bit on the side kind of awesome. passively and getting some hands in been playing a lot of PLO, some PLO eight. So yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I used to not care about WSOP, but I very much care about it now. You know, these guys doing all like the drafts and, and the side bets and stuff like, yeah, I want to, I, mean, I definitely want to go after player. Like you, you're talking about my accomplishments. Like it feels like I've done nothing, you know, like in, in hmm. my mind, like I've done very, very, very little compared to like what I want to do in poker. And, uh, and some mixed game wins are, are a part of what I want to do. So I, I, I can, I can thank you for that. And uh, <laughs> I can't wait to wear my mixed game shirts uh, one day when hopefully I'm, hopefully I find a table, a, a big mixed bracelet. Event. Love it. Well, obviously that question was a little bit tongue in cheek, but I'm glad you took it in the right way. Cause that, you know, I, I genuinely was curious if you kind of had the appetite to go beyond Holden and it's pretty cool oh, yeah. to hear that. And uh, yeah. obviously, uh, you know, a four, eight, fun cash game mix is all great, you know, but when you treat it like a pro, when you put in those hours, I'm sure that uh, you will also see uh, success uh, in those endeavors as well. Um, all right, let's turn to this segment of the show where we turn to you guys, our cards chat community to see what questions you wanted to ask our guests. Of course, we have a dedicated thread on the cards chat forums for this. So as we announce who our future guests will be, please be sure to send in your questions. And I gotta say guys, I'm really happy. We have, I think, three new names that I have never seen before who've submitted questions. So this is really great. Uh, thank you so much to Demibar. I hope I'm getting the pronunciation there right. Uh, Demibar wants to know, Justin, what is the most popular question or type of advice that you've been asked or asked for in poker? I think the most common advice, it comes to like, I'm playing a big tournament this weekend what should i do you know like what like oh. kind of the the last prep of what you should do before a tournament and i think that everybody wants a quick you know quick answers and quick think nuggets to like go be, be better but in reality if if you want to get good at poker and you want to do well in these events like i think just really focusing on getting better every single day and just tiny tiny bits of improvement that way you're not focusing on binging content and binging like improvements right before a big tournament. You can kind of have that confidence that, Hey, I've worked hard for three months now. Mm. Now I get to go perform. Like now I get to go play this tournament. So yeah, I think that's probably awesome. The most common question I get asked. Awesome. Good. And good answer as well. Um, next question also from Demi bar has got one more for you. So what would you advise a beginner in terms of how to start learning? I think that the number one thing I would do is, you know, there's so many different avenues you can go, but there's so much great free content out there. You know, you have Jonathan Little's YouTube putting out content on strategy all the time. You know, you have pokercoaching.com free courses like Master the Fundamentals and then pretty inexpensive books. Um, I think the first big book I read from Jonathan was his Mastery No Limit Hold'em. Mm -hmm. And like, getting some of those basics down and starting to think about tournament or poker in terms of ranges and equity and expected value. And some of those like really, really foundational pieces. Um, I would try to consume as much of the free and, and cheap content as you can and, and get practice in, get, get practice in it probably online. If, you, if it's possible to get as many hands as possible and, 
and uh and enjoy the journey of it enjoy it right good answer and if that doesn't work guys just approach someone ask them how much they charge for poker coaching and offer to do their social media see where it yeah, is. there you go <laughs> that also works um, and i you know it's fun i was wondering where should i insert this but you know a good good point right over there obviously guys we've talked about jonathan little quite a ton if you want to hear more from him directly we did do a podcast with him here as well on the cards chat podcast it was uh, episode number eight i believe so you can go ahead and check that one out if you you haven't already uh 95 other episodes besides this one uh we'll move on to tato ivan uh again hope i'm pronouncing that correctly thank you very much tato ivan for putting this question together and submitting it for justin um justin tato wants to know how do you take a break from poker what kind of rest do you give your brain yeah this is such a great question i um over the past six months have, have been going to therapy quite a bit and I think that's been that's been really huge for me. And one thing of post WSOP therapy that this guy helped me so much with was rest. Because mm-hmm. you know what I did after the series? I did what everybody told me I should do or thought I should do. I slept in. I woke up and went down to my couch. I put a blanket on. I ordered Nutella crepes and French toast. And I watched Netflix. That sounds like a lot of fun. I got to say. It sounds like a lot of fun, right? And within 18 hours... I was more tired. I was kind of sad. I didn't know what to do with myself. Wow. You know, because that isn't how I want to rest. You know, Mm. that's not rest in my mind. Like, and so one thing that I think therapy helped me so much with was like, when you work out, you warm up, you work out and you cool down. Yeah. And I think the cool down process is something that people in poker forget a lot about. Mm. And so now like after the series, it's like, okay, even if it's easy things, I'm going to schedule my day a little bit more. Mm-hmm. I'm going to wake up. I'm going to play chess for 30 minutes. I'm going to go get a haircut. I'm going to go exercise. And then I'm going to study for 20 minutes, you know, a, sh- a quick, short study session. Right. Then I'm going to watch a movie and relax the rest of the evening. But do things to insert, you know, insert some schedule and semblance of, of a cool down. And I think that'll be an, a really nice way to kind of optimize breaks. And it's, awesome. it's been good for me post WSP. That's a, you said it was a great question. That's a fantastic answer. And may I just point out for, you know, the parents among us, you know, your kids are on summer vacation. You know, we try to do the same thing. I can't help myself but say, it's like, we try to do the same thing. Our kids don't have a schedule right now. We said just a few things, 20 minutes of reading, 30 minutes of just going for a walk, any little thing that adds some elements of structure to your day. People crave structure, kids, adults. It's a, it's a good thing to have, but it's a great answer. Just good stuff. Um, Galarado, Galarado 777, our third name we haven't heard before. Uh, Thank you very much for sending in this question. This is a fun one. I'm sure it's going to make you smile. Justin, do you ever wear your WSOP gold bracelet? And would you sell it if you were offered big money? <laughs> <laughs> I do not wear it. Um, I've, I've never worn it. Never? Not and, even once? I mean, I've put it on for sure. Okay. But I've never like worn it out or, you know, gone to play with it or something like that. Uh, would I sell it? Like for the right number, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, definitely would sell a bracelet. But, you know, it's funny. This WSP really did change my mind about bracelets in general and I know you, I, I know there's a big argument to be made that there's so many now and there's so many series and all these things, but like the fun of the WSOP and going after bracelets, it's just a blast. So like I would sell it for a price and I would have sold it for a price last year, but my price now is much higher because I, because I, I, I want more. I want it. <laughs> Nuanced layered answer. I like that. Very, very good. All right. Uh, a couple of our regulars have some questions for you, and that's how we're going to wrap it up. Chica Bonita, thank you very much for sending this one in. Uh, want a couple questions for you. Uh, what do you feel, Justin, when you sit down at the poker table? And what do you think about when the tournament starts? Do you set yourself any sort of regular tasks or goals for tournaments? Yeah. Um, so I definitely have some strategies that I use to try to like get in the zone. I think that kind of how I, I talked about a little bit earlier, like it's really easy to go through the motions in anything and poker is no different. Mm-hmm. Um, so I really am trying hard now at the table to do certain things to focus. And, and some of those things are like focusing on my breath and, and closing my eyes and breathing in through my nose really deeply and, and focusing on what I want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I have, 
little mantras and things I say to myself to try to stay in the moment and stay in the zone. Mm -hmm. Um, Because yeah, it's live tournaments can, can be a different type of grind where maybe you're not playing that many hands, but every three hours you have a really important spot where you need to make a good decision. And if you're not zoned in in that moment, it's, it's going to really affect you. So I think that there's definitely something to be said about the guys who are constantly locked in all the time, Mm -hmm. focused, very serious about their approach to the game. Um, and so, yeah, doing things to try to get in the zone for yourself is is important. Excellent. Cool. Good answer. Uh, two questions from two other very different fields, also from Chico Benita. Uh, how do your family now feel about your choice to play poker professionally? And do they support you? Is there someone who supports you especially strongly? Mm, so... What I would say is my, my, I'm so, so, so lucky. I, I think that I couldn't have done what I did um, and the risk that I took on w- without my parents. You know, I, I am, yeah. I mean, they've just been so supportive of everything from the start, e- even though, you know, maybe they weren't supportive of me initially moving to Vegas. Mm-hmm. They were always extremely supportive of the fact that like, if I, I'm going to do something, I'm going all in. Like I'm going to really go after it. Right. And so they've always tried to encourage that. And they saw it going to poker and it might not have been their favorite, you know, avenue at the start. Um, but even in poker at the very start, they were extremely, extremely encouraging and supportive. Um, and then it hasn't changed. You know, they, I, I don't share uh, the numbers with them anymore because I know it causes them more stress, but from a competition, <laughs> from a competition perspective, uh, they're extremely supportive. You know, they, they're always following the updates and texting me things. And, you know, my dad will every once in a while give the, you know, did you really have to be all in with pocket tens there and spots and things like that? <laughs> but, you know, they're, they're incredible. They're incre- And I don't think there's anybody that, that, uh, you know, supports me more than my family. My brother is still extremely supportive. My sister, you know, my cousins, like the friends back home, everybody is extremely supportive. And, and I think that that's a big reason that, you know, that keeps me motivated. You know, yeah. I, I really feel like I have so much more to do in poker and so much more to accomplish. And, uh, you know, a big part of that is the fact that like, I get to share it with like all these people I love and care about. So yeah. That's awesome. Man, that's such a, that, that last bit in particular, I love that. Again, it's one of those things I would want to replay. Let's remember folks, Justin is 27 years old. So that's an incredibly mature thing to say. It's an awesome motivator and ambition. And, you know, again, so many of us are from, that money maker generation were between the ages of what, 38, you know, 36 and 46. That's like the the peak if you had a bell curve of, you know, who's in poker and seeing, you know, younger guys getting into it, being so hungry, motivated to succeed and have these support networks behind them. You know, at least for for me, who's been in for a little bit longer, I'm 40. It's really, really great to see that uh, the game is nice and healthy with the, the new, newer generation coming in. Um, one more from Chica Bonita, uh, Justin, in your opinion, what are the pros and cons of playing several tables online at the same time? What advice would you give to beginners who are multi multi table? Yeah. Okay. So the pros are you get to put more volume in the cons is that your win rates lower. Anytime you're splitting your attention. If I'm one tabling a cash game, my win rate should be higher than if I'm two tabling a cash game, even. As you get better and better, the difference in win rate should shrink, you know? And so I, my advice would be to slowly add tables. Mm. Um, I started at two tables, then I went to three, then you go to four, and then you get to 16 and you're like, this isn't that bad, it's fine, you know? But you, you can't go from four to 16. You right. need to slowly add tables. And, and the other thing that I think I got really fortunate was something that Jonathan told me to do. When I first went from four to eight, he told me just to move down stakes. And oh, my win rate was still good. At, my win rate was still good in the stakes I was playing, but the practice was super useful at a lower stake. And so, when you're adding tables, I would probably keep that in mind too. Where if I'm in Mexico and I'm playing high stakes, I'm going to be, like right now. I'm going to play less tables than when I'm playing the U.S. schedule on a Sunday. If I have a 10k and a 5k online, I might four table that day or or two table that day or three table. Um, but if I'm playing all the one Oh nines and the two fifteens and the six thirties in the one case, I'm going to 10 table or 12 table. Um, because 
my win, the difference in my win rate, I think is going to, is going to be lower. Whereas when you're playing a 10 K you need to have full focus all the time. So yeah, that'd be my advice. All right. Full comprehensive answer. And again, those are the types of answers you can expect uh, from Justin when it comes to coaching on pokercoaching.com. Our last question asker, uh, we always leave the fun one for last uh, acid burn FX. Uh, lots of fun, creative questions. Justin, if you could get a ticket to any show or event, what would you want a ticket to and why? Oh, wow. Oh, that you, the, you that's the least creative of uh, Acid Burns questions. Really? Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, a lot of ones from right field. These are good. Nice, nice. So, you know what's funny is after I stopped playing soccer, I didn't care about it at all. Like, I totally lost the the enjoyment of watching and playing or any of that any of that stuff but it's just started to come back again okay and so i went to a game in vegas the other day i went to play pickup with some friends and so like if i could go to event it would probably be the champion world cup final nice the champions league final world cup final but probably the world cup final uh that would just be so much fun now i think very cool okay if you could wake up tomorrow with only one thing different about your life what would it be and why Oh my gosh. <laughs> Try to end off on a crescendo. <laughs> okay. One thing different in my life and mm -hmm. why. You know, I put these humidifiers in my house because it was so dry. It is Las Vegas, yeah. And all my doors got swollen and now they won't close. <laughs> so if there was one thing I could wake up in the morning and have better, it'd be the doors close and open easily again. <laughs> It's the best answer. You know what they say, when one door opens, uh, yeah. Um, acid burn FX, thank you for these great questions. Uh, what I love about these questions, beyond just being creative, is you never know what the person's going to say, and it adds, you know, gets some interesting uh, nuggets out of people. Um, what is the best present you've ever received, and why was it so special to you? Oh, man. This is a tough one. Mm. Best present I ever received. I received so many good presents, I think. I'll say, mm -hmm. I will say chess coaching lessons. Oh. I think that I was young, maybe a junior in high school, and I got really into chess, kind of mm -hmm. in, in the same vein I got into poker. And went, I was very all in in chess. And my parents got me these chess lessons with like an, an expert chess player. And I think that that experience in chess probably made a huge, I mean, it definitely made a huge, huge difference in my life today because it kind of gave me the value of like always wanting to learn from people better than you. Yeah. I think there are a lot of people who, you know, can look at people who are better than them and have, envy or jealousy or other negative emotions that cause them to not take in as much knowledge. And that experience uh, with chess was just so big for me because I saw how quickly you can improve at something when you're just, when you just try to be a sponge and just learn like mm. as fast and as much as possible from people who are better than you. And that's mm. still my mindset today. It's like, you know, I'm trying just to learn as fast and as much as possible every single day. Very great answer. Excellent answer. Uh, Three more do. Um, if there were, uh, again, thank you, Acid Burn FX. If there were 26 <laughs> hours in a day, what would you do more of? Work out and meditate. Those are nice. the first two things that fall off my list when days are shorter. Ah. I never, I never don't play enough poker. I never don't, you know, study enough for th these things. But sometimes I let like my physical, like if I could just, get two more hours and those two hours were like work out, meditate, you know, focus on lowering anxiety and things like that. That, that would probably be where I would spend my time. Good answer. Good, good things to be into. That's for sure. But good physical balance as well. Um, if you had the ability to become invisible for a day, which I should say, what, you're six, four, something like that. Six, five. Yeah. Six, yeah, six, yeah it's kind of difficult to be invisible <laughs> at six, four. If you had the ability to become invisible for a day, what would you do and why? Oh my gosh. Great questions. <laughs> <laughs> Invisible for the day. You know what, man? Like, I like my life. I mean, mm. I, I would do the same thing. I, I can't think of something that like I would want to 
been invisible for a day. And maybe I would like, no, I, I don't like people watching. I don't like, you know, going out and being hidden and things like I would just live my life. I, I, I like, I like the routine. I like the schedule. Yeah. Nothing too exciting. Sorry about that. No, no need to be sorry. That's great. That I, I love that. That's a very self-confident answer. And it's really cool to speak to someone who loves what they do so much that you wouldn't change anything. That's great. And uh, last question for you, Justin, from Acid Burn FX. What small gesture from a stranger made a big impact on you? We will allow a time bank chip for this one. As yeah, our one final time question. Yeah. So, yeah, this is a an interesting story, but yeah, I mean, it, it, this was huge from my perspective. So, mm -hmm. I was playing chess at the time, competitively in high school, and Columbus hosted an event, and it was in this beautiful place called the North Market. And you play on the second story and it was a wonderful place to play. I almost said play cards, but play chess Yeah, and play cards too, but, but play chess at the time. And this guy comes from to the table and I was like a reasonably good chess player at this point, like playing, I would say like top 20 in the state or something like that. And, and uh, we're playing good other good players from, from the Ohio area. And this guy comes up from some, from an inner city Columbus school mm -hmm. And he has long dreads and his pants are below his waist and he had chains on. And my initial thought as a kid was I'm about to crush this guy in chess. Mm -hmm. He absolutely dismantled me, mm -hmm. absolutely dismantled me. And after a game of chess, when you're young, sometimes you go through the game and hearing him talk and hearing him talk about the game. It was way different than the way I approached things. It was way different than the way I studied or learned. But this guy was a, absolute genius and like it made me feel silly at the start to have so much confidence in, mm. in that and I think it like really helped shape my perspective that you know people can dress a certain way or look a certain way or be a certain you know they might have different views than you or whatever but like that doesn't mean they don't have incredible skill or value or or all of those things so yeah that, that was a, a a notable experience from when I was young that like yeah he was, I don't know his name he was a stranger but like that experience like always sticks with me and just kind of, yeah, super grateful to have gotten crushed in, in chess. And I mean, he destroyed me. If you saw what happened in this chess game, like what is going on? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it was dismantling. And wow. I, I mean, yeah. I and mean, when you get beat that badly, like it really like pushes you back. Like you're like, what just happened? And, and so that was a, that was a fun experience. That's really cool. And that's, I got to say also a great, note on which to end you know just again like I, I you know it's it's wonderful speaking to someone who just has such a thirst for knowledge and an appreciation for it because you know that, that story tells so much about you and your character so many people could have reacted in a thousand different ways anger frustration just i'm giving this up i thought i was all that you know and just the way you took it as something that obviously had such a big impact on you but in such a positive way uh, a huge thing. Um, thank you, everyone who sent in questions for Justin Saliba. And again, a friendly reminder to all of you out there in our Cards Chat community that we'd love to see you submit your questions for our future podcast guests in the dedicated thread on the forums. Guys, please be sure to give us a good review on iTunes and spread the word via your social media channels if you like the show. Justin, this has been a pleasure. Before we let you go, anything else you'd like to tell our listeners? Uh, keep enjoying it. Enjoy the game. You know, I think too many people, uh, too many people let themselves have, you know, ups and downs in poker with their results. And yeah, if I had one last piece of advice, just like enjoy the full journey, enjoy the wins, enjoy the losses. Like at the end of the day, we're just playing cards and it's, it's so, so much fun. So yeah, thanks it. for having me on and I appreciate you guys. You got it. Thank you very much to, again to Justin Saliba. Thank you all for tuning in once again to another episode of the Cards Chat Podcast. I'm Robbie Straczynski. You can follow me on Twitter at Card Player Life. I wish you all a wonderful day.